Good morning, everybody, and welcome to this campaign's breakfast meeting. This is our second meeting for campaigners, and it's a pleasure um, to see you all. Um, I think you all know my name, but I'm Sofia Parentu. I'm a, a member of the Sustainable Food Places team, and I'm hosting this meeting with my colleagues Vera Zakharov and Ren Piercy. Do you want to say hello? Hi, everybody. Nice to see you all. Hi, morning. Right. So these, these meetings are really here to, to hear from campaigns on the ground. Uh, so you guys can hear from us uh, and relevant um, national issues that are important for local campaigns and to learn new things. And this session today, the first part of the session today is really to hear from a campaigner and a member of parliament um, and to learn from them to learn from this powerful example, how to engage your MP in issues that you're passionate about that can really make a difference to your local area, but to also other areas around the UK. And, um, and I would like to introduce Hannah Cameron McKenna and MP Vera Hobhouse, who will take us through a little bit of their history, how they've been working together uh, on an issue that is relevant for, for all of you campaigners out there the school fruit and veg scheme. Um, so would you like to introduce yourselves, first of all, Hannah, Vera? Sure, uh, yeah, hi, my name's Hannah. Um, so I live in Bath, I've lived here for uh, nearly 10 years. Um, and I have two um, small children, one of whom is at school locally. Um, I have never done any campaigning in my life before, um, but I am, uh, quite involved in community stuff and I run a little community group um, around where we live and that's actually where I first met Vera is that um, we were um, sort of hoping to turn a piece of land that was essentially pretty um, pretty derelict and unloved into a really lovely field with um, trees and to be a hub for our local community and Vera um, when she was very new to being an MP for Bath uh, was really supportive and came along to a picnic to come and meet us so that's where we first met um, and well, I'll, I'll go into more of the campaign first but yeah that's that's me. Thank you. Well, good morning, everybody. Um, first of all, you don't become an MP without being a, a campaigner first. So you start as a community campaigner. Uh, you make your, your way um, well, through the ranks. I did um, uh, local politics for 10 years, um, not in Bath, but uh, we lived in Rochdale at the time. And then you, you turn from a community campaigner into an elected member of the council. And suddenly it's, very, it's a strange transition because uh, while you were a campaigner, you did all the stuff for the right reasons. Once you become an elected politician, uh, a lot of the time people um, suspect, uh, you know, some sort of um, strange motives why you're doing something or why you don't do something. And you can continue. The, the problem of being an elected member, either of the council or later of parliament, is that you can easily turn native. So uh, you, uh, you see why things are the way they are, why the councils run the way it is. It's more complicated than you think. There are um, different interests pulling at, uh, at opposite ends of, of the scale and suddenly you're a decision maker um, and you become more part of the, the establishment. Uh, and if you're not careful, you forget that you're a campaigner. Now, I have looked at myself always as a campaigner. Uh, my, my most recent campaign was to stop Brexit. Um, so, you know, the, the, the campaigns that I've been running or my, I've, I've campaigned with um, local people and that's often how it works now, with local people to stop um, the demolition of Fox Hill. So you can be a politician that either goes natives and, and just sort of is part of the decision and doesn't want to face the public anymore, or you are a campaigner um, as a politician as well. Uh, and, and that balance is often quite difficult. Um, but but, but I'm at, at, at heart, I'm a campaigner, I'm a freedom fighter. I, if I see injustice or something that can be made better, uh, then I'm fully on the side of the people who want to campaign for that. Thank you so much for that. Um... So you're, you're among friends here, <laughs> and I really appreciate Hannah and Vera taking time off from your busy professional lives and personal lives to, to talk to us. And uh, we're, we're all here campaigners. Um, we have people from all over the country that are connected to members. They are members of sustainable food places, and they campaign for better food and farming locally. Um, so how 
so we're particularly interested in the example of the school fruit and veg scheme and the work you the campaign you've done on it because uh, many of us campaign for more veg less sugar so it's a really relevant example so let's start from the beginning um how did it all start so the scheme was suspended after lockdown but it wasn't reinstated when children from year one started to go back to, to schools in, in many parts of the country and in Bath in June. And what, what happened then, Anna? Why, why this, this came to your attention? So, um, so my eldest son uh, was um, in year one at the time and um, he was going back to school, I think around the 8th of June. Um, and we were really keen for him to get back to school and he was keen to get back to school. So it was all very positive. Um, and we had a message from the school saying um, it's really important not to bring too many things into school at the moment because of COVID, but the children need to bring a water bottle and a piece of fruit with them. And initially I didn't give it any thought at all because um, we're really lucky and we have um, a big bowl of fruit in the kitchen. And I thought it's fine, he can just grab a banana, it's no big deal. And it was only when I was talking to my husband that evening that hit my husband was like, why does he have to bring fruit? We never brought fruit before and I was like I don't I'm not really sure so I just sent the school a message they said oh um our government um the free fruit we get from the government has stopped and I actually didn't know about the school fruit and veg scheme before then I was aware that they had free um fruit and veg in the classroom but I didn't really understand that it was completely different to free school meals because Obviously my uh, son is in key stage one, so he gets free school meals. I didn't understand that it was a completely separate scheme. So I thought, oh, this is probably just like a thing with just his school and schools are under so much pressure at the moment. Um, my husband's a teacher and I was fully aware of the pressure they were under. So I thought I'm not gonna kick up a fuss about it. So um, I actually approached the our PTA that I'm a member of, our, so our Parent Teacher Association, and I said I just wondered if we could look at um, bridging the gap and paying for some fruit for the kids just for the summer term. And they were happy to do that, but they were like, we need to find out what's going on, like why, why is the school not getting the fruit? So over the next day or so, I spoke to lots of other parents um, in Bath, uh, at different schools, they said the same. No, 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 my kids aren't getting fruit either. So then I was like, there's something weird going on. Um, and someone had said to me, oh, it's, so it's this thing called the school fruit and veg scheme. So I basically just Googled it, looked them up, uh, rung them the main number, and they said, oh, it's been suspended and we haven't been told why. And I started to feel a bit like... Um, I was the first person that had realized that this happened. And I know, in fact, I wasn't the only person that realized, but no one was talking about it, wasn't in the press, like no, no one was saying anything about it. And I appreciate, you know, it was a really complicated time where there was a lot of logistics, but I felt like there was a danger that maybe it had just gone because when I spoke to the school fruit and veg um, scheme, the team there who were incredibly helpful, they could give me no reassurance that it was coming back at all. And that, that was that I, you know, had a kind of light bulb moment where I thought, okay, this is, this is bigger than that. It's just been, it's just been paused because of lockdown and this is that we need to do something about this. And what about you, Vera? Were you aware of the suspension of the scheme or was it through constituents like Hannah who brought it to your attention? Were you engaged in school, um, school food matters before? Was this a field that you were particularly interested in? So first of all, um, uh, every campaign starts with asking questions. And in fact, a lot of politics is about asking questions. So either you question the status quo or you question why something is not how it was. Uh, so, you know, this is absolutely how you start a campaign that you think, ooh, uh, what's going on here? Uh, let me ask a question and find out. Um, and uh, and then you go, you know, you 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 ask your questions further and further up the, the scale. And indeed, I didn't know uh, that this has been suspended and a lot of uh, things. And that, no wonder that the public questions politics. Uh, a lot of stuff happens behind closed doors. It doesn't get published everywhere. And fair enough, it was in the middle of COVID when everything, uh, you know, the whole country was an uproar and, and tumult and, and people didn't know how, how, where their livelihoods would be coming from. And it was just one of those things that the government dropped 
Um, and I needed, to, I needed to be made aware of it because I, you know, I was fully involved in all sorts of other stuff. And I, I, am the, oh, I was until two weeks ago the spokesperson for the climate emergency. So a lot around the climate emergency was also very much on the forefront of, of my mind. So what, what we do once people were coming back. Uh, uh, from lockdown, you know, can we take advantage of, of, of all the positive things around nature and, and, and stopping pollution and all the rest of it. So I was very focused on quite a lot of that stuff, apart from many, many, many uh, constituents coming on, uh, coming, coming on worrying about their jobs and their livelihoods. So no, I wasn't aware of it. So it is important that then people come and knock on, on the door of your local politician that can be either the council or that can be then further up uh, 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 in parliament. Uh, and then you need to sort of find out where these decisions actually sit. Sometimes it's also quite difficult to find out who has made that decision. Was that a local decision? Was that a decision at, 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 at a national level? And then I am the one then who has to ask um, questions on your behalf, because although I'm a member of parliament, I'm, I can make decisions on legislation, but I'm not in government. So, uh, and, and people often don't understand that either. In, in, we've got different political parties. Uh, one political party wins an election and they form the government and they make the decisions. So the opposition then can also only ask questions. Uh, they have bigger access and greater access to, uh, to government ministers. But that is probably um, uh, the only advantage I have over you guys. And often now the press takes, um, takes campaigns or questions or, or, or uh, you know, uh, big issues easier on board and publishes it if it comes from a member from the public than if, if it comes from a member of the opposition because they say, oh, they'll just do that because it's politics. And she would criticize the government, wouldn't she? But if it's member of, members of the public and bigger and bigger groups um, of people raising the same issue, like, for example, currently around testing, then that is how the, the press picks it up. It's people, it's ordinary people, although I never quite understand what has made me less ordinary, but it's ordinary people who raise the question who, who make a big fuss, uh, and it often gets bigger attention than, than if I raise an issue um, a, a, as, a, as an opposition politician. Um, uh, but then, of course, you have your issue of resources. We do have resources as, as, as parliamentarians. We've got people um, who work for us and do research, whereas you, you know, first of all, you have to get wade your way through the whole of the political system, but also uh, you need to give your own time in researching. And we often have um, paid staff who can do research and find out stuff on our behalf and can probably get uh, to the answer of a few things more quickly uh, than you can, because I can just ask um, the parliamentary library or I can actually ask a written parliamentary question. And then once I do that and I get very quickly an answer where it all is. So I do have that advantage. But in terms of raising an issue publicly, often um, members of the public are much better placed to doing that than, than politicians themselves. And um, to raise, so to, to raise that, that issue in Parliament through the, the parliamentary question, which, which you've done, and in that access to, to ministers that you have, how important was the, the local data and to, to translate the issue into what that means for your constituents? Well, absolutely. I mean, evidence is, is, is what counts. Um, and, uh, uh, and so the research was, was mainly done by, by your campaign group. And these sort of things are vitally important. I mean, I could have found that out too, but it would have probably taken me an, an, another bit of time, but also that you, you know, raise the severity of the issue on my behalf, then I take it up because a lot of people want me to do a lot of things. So I pick, I pick, I pick and choose too, because I cannot possibly do everything. So I do the things that make the most sense to me, um, that are the most evidence-based, often that affect um, most people, of course, um, uh, uh, and then I can take them up on your behalf, and then I have got bigger access, um, certainly um, to the machinery of government, uh, you probably have got an advantage when it comes to raise um, an issue like that in the press. I can then come in with you and say, yes, I'm really upset about this too. And for example, the big school funding marches, I was sort of going with people and marched. Um, so, you know, I can help you by joining your, 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 your campaigns and your, your marches. Um, and I can help you by asking the question, have better um, um, access to government. But in terms of the bread and butter of the campaign, that's much better provided uh, uh, by people like you. But as I say, I come from a campaigning background. I've, and you know, any of you can probably 
So try and make yourself known and say, look, I want to do local politics. I want to be at the, at the, at the heart of decision making uh, or you know, understand much better how all, all these things come about. And who knows, you can end up as a member of parliament. You know, you, 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 it, it really is as simple as that. I was a teacher too. I studied art, actually. Uh, you know, I have done all sorts of stuff in life. I'm not a professional politician. I came to politics because I wanted to make things better. Yeah, that's, that's really inspiring. I think you've, you've said something really interesting there about um, the number of requests and, and, and emails and, and phone calls you get on a daily basis. You, you, I, I, I have the impression you get hundreds a day. And um, so how, and I think this will be important for everyone in, in, in this meeting here today. And please guys, if you have any questions for Hannah or Vera, type them in the chat. Um, but how, how to come across so that, you know, we'll be the ones that get to your attention. And I think Hannah, in, in the conversations we had before, I think you mobilized local networks uh, which might have made your, you know, your ask and your issue more relevant for Vera. Um, yeah, so what I, essentially what I did when, um, when I found out that the um, school fruit and veg scheme had definitely been suspended with, you know, no idea whether it was going to come back at all. The first thing I did was get in touch with my ward councillor, um, who... Again, like Vera, um, I've had lots of contact with um, and she's been incredibly helpful in our other local campaigns. Um, and I knew that um, she knew Vera, so um, I got in touch with Jess um, and Jess was incredibly supportive. And uh, so Jess then put me in touch with Vera's uh, parliamentary assistant um, and together um, Jess then helped, um, I think maybe, uh, put some questions together that Vera then asked the written questions in parliament. But it was really through, initially through that contact with my war councillor, I felt that she was able to sort of flag that to Vera because I was more than aware that Vera would be absolutely inundated with um, really valid concerns from her constituents in Bath. But I guess the thing that um, concerned me and where I felt like it was really imperative that Vera take this on as a cause was that in Bath, and I'm sure this is the case in lots of England and the UK, um, we are quite a divided city in, in terms of um, wealth. And so just in the area that I live in, there is a school down the road, which is relatively, it's a, a state's primary school, but it's relatively wealthy. Um, and they seem to have lots of funds. Um, and then there's a school, you know, a few hundred meters away, but they just don't have the same, it's just not the same setup at all for whatever reason. And I felt that one of the reasons that the school fruit and veg scheme was going, that the suspension was going largely unnoticed with this, was the wealthier schools that either had, they literally had the funds themselves or they had the wealthier parents who could help, were just plugging the gap without, telling anybody which is completely understandable because they were just trying to do the right thing for the kids but I felt that all that's going to happen is the um the gap between advantages and disadvantaged kids that we have especially in Bath was just going to get wider and wider and wider and so with Jess my war counsellor she then helped me sort of put that to Vera as like this is why I think this is absolutely crucial that this scheme comes back and, and, and that then points to, you know, what is politics or what are the bigger issues of politics? So for me, um, social injustice and the, the, the growing inequality gap is, is, is at, the, at the heart of why I want to be in politics in the first place, apart from tackling the climate emergency. So, so of course, you, get, you then get different types of politicians. Some find that an absolutely vital issue to address because it has got wider implications. You know, you could originally say what's an apple and what's a banana. But actually, if you if you translate that of what it means, um, you know, about healthy nutrition for the people uh, who cannot afford it or who, who, who are not in the same um, way uh, aware of what what healthy food is. And you know, we've got the uh, prime minister talking about the obesity strategy. Uh, but I find in, 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 in my world, he just sort of misses what is really at the bottom of the problem. Um, and that is, um, uh, you know, people much be better, much better understanding of what a healthy diet is, um, but also giving the means um, and the knowledge base um, to parents to understand, uh, uh, you know, how their children can grow up or how them, how they themselves can, 
can feed themselves well. I talked about being a, a counselor in a, in a different city. So I used to live and uh, my husband's business uh, is up in the Northwest near M Manchester. Uh, and Bath is always seen as quite a prosperous city, but I lived with, and my children grew up in Rochdale, which is one of the most deprived areas uh, in, in, in all of the UK. So I know well um, uh, the issues of deprivation. And, 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 and the problem about Bath is that you're absolutely right. We have got that division between um, wealthy parts and, and, uh, and, and deprived parts. We had the same in Rochdale, it was just in reverse. Most people lived in very deprived areas um, and a few, there were a few bubbles um, of, of, of real wealth. In Bath, it's a bit the other way around. Most parts um, are, are well off comparatively, um, but we have um, small, very uh, you know, heavily deprived areas. And the problem in Bath is, because they are a much smaller part, they often get forgotten. Whereas um, in, 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 in towns like uh, the one I, I, I used to live in, Greater Manchester, it's in the forefront of what the council does all the time. So um, that means that uh, you, you need to shout even louder for the people um, uh, who, 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 who live in much more disadvantaged um, um, circumstances. And, and for that reason, um, you know, I, 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 I really welcome what you've done because it shows uh, very much um, a sense of um, community and understanding that uh, it's not just for yourselves, it's, it's particularly for those who are disadvantaged. And those are the issues that I warmly welcome to be brought to my attention. Uh, and, and then just one word about, about um, Jess, uh, you know, it worked, again, you could get um, hold of Jess because she's quite visible. I think um, a lot of uh, what is important in politics is that you're visible, that people know where you're going to. Um, there, there are some areas in the country where people don't even know where who their, their ward councillor is, and that's bad. Um, so we need to make sure that, uh, you know, you also come campaign always for transparency and visibility, that people know I can go to that person, I can complain, I can shout, I might get answers, I might finally also understand why certain things are the way they are, but we always have, as elected members, have to face some music, I find. Um, and for that reason, you know, in this case it worked very well, Jess picked it up immediately, she ran with it as well, together with yourselves. So it's, it's, it's in many ways a, a picture book way of how campaigns should go, because uh, you got somewhere quite quickly. Uh, some, some people take months and years to get anywhere. Uh, but you will also learn, and I say that as a last thing, MP, somebody said in Parliament, stands for most persistent. Uh, in politics, you have to keep at it. Yeah, it anything that resolves it, itself very quickly can't have been a big problem. Uh, I mean, I say that cynically, but it is true. Most things are complicated and therefore the resolution takes time and you need to stick with it and keep at it. I, I think this is a really good segue <laughs> to, uh, to mention, and Ben has just put it on the chat, that um, even though we got the, the confirmation that the school fruit and veg scheme would be reinstated in September, now the next step in our campaign is to push for an expansion uh, of the scheme to all children in primary school in England, not just Key Stage 1. And we hope the other nations in the UK will be interested in, in replicating a similar scheme. Um, we're also interested in improving that scheme so that more British fruit and veg um, is, is part is part of what children eat every morning in school. Um, and well, if uh, I just, we've if just, I, yeah, we've just I, started a, a, this, this campaign around the comprehensive spending review that is coming out in the autumn, calling for five game-changing measures for children's health. And the expansion of the school fruit and veg scheme is one of them. Uh, so I hope you'd, all you campaigners and you, Vera, can, can support us um, this, this autumn. Yeah, can, can I just make um, a, a, another point? Reinstating something that has already happened, so that change um, of um, a scheme for fruit and vegetable in school was already in place. People had probably worked for many months and years in order to make that happen in the first place. Um, so to, to revert to something that the government had ultimately done is... Uh, is a relatively easy step, although not, not by all means. And I don't want to um, you know, diminish the campaign that you've done, mainly because you were quick on the ball. You said immediately, this is an outrage that cannot happen. Uh, uh, and the government very quickly had to, had to U-turn on what it had done. Um, but the, the, the much more difficult thing now is to, to get an extension to make the government spend even more money. And, and it's ultimately, it's always about money. It's always about where the resources, the government resources go and making a case why 
um, this is so important. And, and, and uh, in that context, you always then have to create a bigger context and say, look, and I, I'd say in your case, uh, you can easily um, tie it into the, 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 the Prime Minister's obesity strategy. Yeah? Go and say, look, you Prime Minister, and I will today, actually later on in about an hour, uh, I'm asking a question in, in uh, a Prime Minister's question time. I was picked that sometimes it's gold dust. It only happens um, every once in a while. So I'm, I'm going to ask a question on the Prime Minister's obesity strategy. In this case, it's about, because I'm the uh, a, a chair of the a Eating Disorders APPG, so it's about the effect of the government's strategy on people who've, who are suffering from anorexia and bulimia. But let's, let's uh, take that apart. You, if you want to be clever, have an angle, yeah? Have a, have a hook uh, and say, look guys, you know, big thing, obesity strategy, uh, the, the, the Prime Minister is a, a proposing this, that, and the other, but, um, isn't you know the fruit and veg pro program in school absolutely where we need to start with young kids eating healthily, eating something that's good food, not, not junk food or whatever the prime minister calls it. So make the most of the thing that the government wants to do and then sort of half applaud and half criticize uh, and say, look, but you can make that better, you can do this sort of thing with it. Uh, and bang, um, you, 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 you might have gone halfway towards what you want to achieve. Yeah. I, I think you've really inspired us there. <laughs> um, and I, actually, um, we want to talk to this group in particular about what we have planned for the autumn. So rather than wait for the end, I, I think I'm going to ask Vera to, um, to, tell us, to tell us all about the plans. And I'm aware that we have a question from Sonia um, about um, uh, how to go about um, when you have multiple uh, MPs in a, in a local area you work on, but you live in one, so which one you can contact. Let's leave that for later, um, because I think this is a really good segue to talk about our plans uh, for the autumn and our ideas um, for measures that can be life-changing for kids' health around the UK. And we have an opportunity in, in this autumn spending review uh, to push for them in, the, in that wider context of the obesity strategy, of the national food strategy, um, and I hope all the campaigners here will, you, will help us to, um, to get that, that to the attention of, of the Chancellor and, and the relevant government departments. So Vera, do you want to come up now? Hi everybody, um, I'm about to share my screen, but just before I say I just want to say I find it so inspiring hearing from both Hannah and Vera as the basically is the kind of, as I see the, really the change makers uh, when it comes to our food system and our society wider. And you know, this is really what Sustain and our colleagues within Sustainable Food Places are really here to do. We're here to support people like you guys uh, to create that change. So, um, so on, uh, following on from that, I'm gonna share my screen and just do a quick um, update on our, um, our action around the comprehensive spending review. Um, so as Sophia mentioned, uh, one of the actions. So we, um, we have put together five policy calls um, that we feel really are kind of, a, they need to be together as a holistic package of improving children's access to healthy food and improving their health outcomes um, and really just quality of life. And we feel that the comprehensive spending review this year, this is really the opportunity for government to show leadership on this. Um, and as we've seen in the past few months, First of all, COVID has really exposed the deep, deep health inequalities in our communities. It also exposed the, um, the really, um, the vital role schools play. I mean, it's beyond just education. Schools are a safety net for so many children, a nutritional safety net, um, and a place where they can guarantee to have um, a healthy meal or sometimes two meals if they're receiving free um, school breakfast. So, you know, um, and the other thing is obviously COVID has shown that, um, that health inequalities pose further risks for uh, crises such as a health pandemic. So this is the time to act. Um, so, um, so as uh, Sophia and Ben have mentioned, we have a public e-action um, around these five asks, but I'd like to give you guys a quick overview. Um, I should probably start the slideshow. I'm beginning, there we go. Um, so our five calls are, um, uh, in brief, uh, to invest the soft drinks industry levy, uh, the sugar tax income, uh, to spend on children's health via a healthy food fund. Um, and just, uh, just as Vera mentioned uh, earlier, actually, sometimes it's easy to reinstate something that was there before. Well, actually, um, the sugar levy was previously being um, 
being uh, invested in, um, in infrastructure improvement uh, within schools uh, to uh, improve children's health. And that included um, healthy food projects such as growing, um, such as food growing, uh, uh, kitchen improvements, dining facilities improvements, and cookery education. So we are calling on that to be basically reinstated because at the moment that money is not being ring fenced. Uh, and so of course, um, schools are not able to access uh, sugar levy money to invest in uh, children's access to healthy food. So that's our first call. The second call, um, by the way, no particular order. <laughs> These are all really important calls. Our second policy call is, of course, expanding the school fruit and vegetable scheme to all primary age children um, and sourcing high standard produce from British farmers. So this is not just going to help uh, children and families. This should also help um, um, our agriculture sector, especially, um, especially to produce sustainably sustainable produce. Um, the third policy call is to increase the Healthy Start voucher value to 425. Um, it has not been increased in many years, uh, so it's not in line with inflation, and to extend it to all pregnant women and families uh, with uh, children under the age of four on universal credit or equivalent benefits. Um, the fourth call is to expand free school meals to all children and young people whose, family, whose families are on universal credit or equivalent benefits. And uh, the, the fifth one is to extend the holiday activity and food program to all children in receipt of free school meals in England. So, um, of course, the, the, the last three on Healthy Start free school meals and holiday uh, activity and food programs, um, these are calls that have been outlined in the National Food Strategy as well. Um, Marcus Rashford and others are also campaigning quite visibly about this. Um, but we believe that the fruit and veg scheme is absolutely part of it. I think it's part of the picture of healthy food access in schools. Um, it is a nutritional safety net for uh, the as majority of children are not receiving uh, their five a day. And of course, the soft drinks industry, Levy, this is such an opportunity to actually add value to uh, you know most of those other calls because really, if you have more children eating free school meals, you need to make sure that your facilities are up to standard. And if we really want to uh, address uh, health inequalities and improve um, uh, in, to lower child obesity, really, we need to be investing in, um, in uh, better food provision, better food education within schools as well. So our action plan, uh, I'll tend to do it in brief. Um, so we are doing the public e-action, as we mentioned. So please do take part, please promote it. But the other really crucial thing, especially for uh, you guys here from food partnerships and local authorities, is we're doing an open letter on behalf of local food and health leads. So this is really like the local voices. Uh, we're pulling together an open letter on these five policy calls uh, to key government ministers. So this is the uh, the Treasury, the Department for Education, and the Department for Health and Social Care. Um, and this open letter is going to be signed by directors of public health, uh, food partnership leads, that's many of you guys here, um, in, um, in some places other um, leaders whose voices really count on this, so in some cases it might be mayors. Um, so we leave to local areas to decide that. And um, we're also um, recruiting national organizations to sign our letter as well, who focus on food, health, children, schools, poverty, really the issues that matter within this context. And our deadline for signatures is 30th September. So everybody here, please do um, get in touch. Please uh, you know, get in touch with your directors of public health um, and others to make sure that your local area is represented in this. Um, we're also supporting the Food Foundation and others, um, including Marcus Rashford, on uh, their calls specifically to do with um, free school meals and that kind of uh, meal provision and healthy start. Um, and we're also publishing a number of publications to really underscore the value of putting these policies in place. Um, so um, we put together a representation to the Treasury, which you guys are welcome to read. We can share that. It goes into detail on these five calls, and it's a really good document to really lay the case for all five of them. Uh, we're also uh, pulling together a report and school survey uh, analysis on the um, on ring fencing the sugar levy for school food activities. Um, so we are still running the survey, by the way. So please do continue promoting into your school leads um, and others. This is to capture the, the benefits that have come out of the Healthy People's Capital Fund, uh, which was the previous way that um, the sugar levy was ring fenced to support uh, food access in schools. Um, and we're calling for that new fund. So this report will kind of um, outline really what we're calling and really why it's really important to bring it back in. Um, and also um, a briefing on the school fruit and veg scheme um, and a bit of research that Sophia with a colleague has undertaken 
um, to really outline um, the importance of expanding it. Um, and uh, we also have some, um, some assets that we'll be sharing with you guys. I'm just uh, cycling through them here, but um, I'll, I'm gonna go ahead and stop the share because I think that was probably enough information. Uh, thank you so much. Um, over back to you guys. And yeah, please, please do get involved. Uh, we're gonna be working on this in the next couple of weeks. So if, if, if everyone around here has questions, please type them in the, um, in the chat, please. Um, and uh, while we still have Vera, we had a previous uh, question from Sonia in Leeds. So um, I think we have time. Sonia, do you want to, to ask your question? Certainly. Um, in Leeds, we've got eight MPs, and my local MP is, you know, long-standing um, backbencher um, Labour. He's brilliant, but I really want to get the voices of the three Conservatives that we've got. Um, how can I, when, he, when, yeah, I mean, people, I mean, um, even members of the of, of food wise of our food partnership, they don't live in the uh, in the constituencies either. Um. Well, you can always um, uh, write to them too. Um, I mean, I, 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 my neighbor is Jacob Rees-Mogg. Um, so, um, you know, the, 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 the contrast couldn't be different between, between him, and, him and me, but I, yeah. Um, first, my uh, first generation migrant, uh, I speak English with a foreign accent, blah, blah, and I'm a woman. Uh, and I'm a liberal democrat and he is a, 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 he's a very very conservative so I get quite a lot of people from um, northeast Somerset which is his constituency who, who write to me and say oh Vera you know my MP just doesn't listen to me um, and of course um, the, 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 the parliamentary convention is that you can really only deal with constituents um, yourself and then you're, you're meant to pass it on that's mainly around issues of, you know, if you've got a housing issue or so on and so forth. For campaign issues, you can always try. Um, you, but you can also try to ask your MP to write to the other MP. So, uh, yeah, I don't know who's your MP? Fabian Hamilton. Sorry? Fabian Hamilton. Okay. I, I mean, he... He's, I, he's I, peace. But, but I write to him and say, look, this is so important. I'm sure you agree. Uh, would you mind contacting um, other Leeds MPs um, to, uh, uh, to, 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 to really make this work? Um, I mean, you can try yourself, but I'd always say possibly going via your MP to ask mm. him to contact others uh, might, might, might be um, a, 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 an opportunity. I, we, we get lots and lots and lots of people wanting us to do things, everything. Yeah, for, uh, uh, you know. So um, sometimes people won't reply and then I come back to uh, my thing about saying most persistent as a campaigner you've got to be most persistent bother people and that's um, something that I'd say to everybody in Bath as well you know the people bother me most uh, and I've got a I've got a, a campaign group or a lady um, about assisted dying and really I re didn't really want to engage in the subject of assisted dying but she has done it again and again and again and finally she has persuaded me to go to, to groups and APVGs and I'm coming round. So, you know, these sort of things, you know, if you've got a responsive MP, ultimately to knock and knock and knock on the door, I know it's frustrating. I know uh, it takes a lot of your time, but that's how you break through. Be most persistent. Thank you. I think, I think that's a good lesson for us all. Persistent pays. And, um, and what, just going back to the beginning, um, Vera, what you said about, that's what a campaigner does. You get outraged and you start asking the questions and you go up higher and higher and higher in the hierarchy chain until you finally get there and, and someone answers your questions and opens the door. But you also hit a lot of brick walls, yeah? You, yeah. you, you will hit a lot of brick walls. So uh, you, you just get to, and, and I, I, I had a, an interesting council officer who said to me, I never give up, but I'm like a mole. I hit a brick wall and then I go somewhere else. And, you know, rather than hitting the same brick wall, be creative and thinking, all right, this didn't quite work. I tried several times, didn't work. Let's try something else. So it's also about being quite creative about what next to do um, rather than being stuck in one, one way of doing it. I mean, I, I, uh, Vera, you, you, you made an excellent presentation there and you've already made... Um, 
uh, uh, quite a lot of progress and it, it looks incredibly professional. Um, so you know, engaging, for example, directors of public health, I think is a good idea because they do actually have a lot of cloud. Um, so these sort of things are absolutely right. If you don't get the politicians, go and get somebody else, uh, and, but keep engaging with the press. Because I, 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 you know, I would say people power works. It really does. So never forget um, how you also engage with uh, you know, the wider public, uh, how you make sure your social media channels are you know, all very awake and alert to it. The more people talk about it on Facebook, on Twitter, uh, uh, the more you get, uh, you get this um, you know, widespread engagement into the campaign. Thank you. That's that's excellent advice, and I hope you know all all the campaigners locally uh, help us to create that noise. Um, I actually have I have another question for you, Vera, um, about access to government departments um, and something you've said before. Because even though you're in opposition, you have much better access to government departments that we we have on the outside. So I was I was just thinking if you can clarify. Um, you know, the, the limits of your influence, what can you do? So if you as a member of the public write to a government department, they probably don't reply. So um, and I, 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 I'd say don't even try, go via your MP. And, and then, you know, possibly you, you might hit um, a, a brick wall there, but then you have to sort of keep asking, but if it doesn't work, then you are where you are. That you, you then can try your local councillors, see whether you enthuse somebody there. Uh, access to your local council um, and, and writing to the council or trying to engage with any of the councillors, uh, be that a district council or a unitary, is probably another way of trying to raise um, awareness of, of the issue and, and get attention. Um, but yes, I, I mean, what, what I usually do um, is I mean, COVID time is difficult, but people will come to my surgery as a group, for example, say, Vera, I want you to do this. And if you have persuaded me, because you always need to persuade me first, they say, all right, I take that up on your behalf. And the easiest thing I can do also for my team, I've got two caseworker teams. I've got a parliamentary assistant, a comms, I've got about five people working for me, six people. It's not a lot. Um, so the caseworkers also have got lots and lots of stuff to do on, in, in, in terms of, uh, helping people with real issues in, on immigration, on housing and so on and so forth. But the easiest thing for my caseworker team is if you've got a ready-made letter, you know, a ready-made thing, a question that you want to ask and, and ask the minister directly, not me, because I have no influence, but to the minister. And I would say, draft me that letter. I write, I send it in to, uh, on your behalf and we pass it on and we get then a go governmental reply. Sometimes that takes weeks. Sometimes it comes back quite quickly, but it takes at least two weeks. I can also ask, a written parliamentary question myself, and I will get a response quite quickly. Um, so there are two ways of, of doing these things. Another way of raising um, uh, attention to, uh, uh, to an issue is, is trying to ask for a debate. So if you've got enough MPs who want to debate, um, you know, the fruit and veg scheme or healthy eating at school, um, we have the, the opportunity uh, as backbenchers to ask that certain things are debated. Most of the time, most debates in Parliament are initiated by the government, like, for example, currently uh, the immigration bill, that's a government that wants to have that debate, that's six days of debate. But we occasionally get a few slots for backbench debates, and we can apply to the backbench business committee for a particular debate, and um, it needs to be supported by a cross-section of MPs. So again, if you get a lot of, if you think it's a, 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 um, a, an issue worth debating, either um, in, a, in, in the main chamber or in Westminster Hall, currently suspended, by the way, because of COVID, um, but, but that is also a way of, of getting a government minister into the chamber to have to respond. Um, so that would be a, a, another way, for example, I could think, all right, and uh, it's something that I want to, want to be debated in Parliament, either in the main chamber or in Westminster Hall. Uh, then I can sort of make, uh, make contacts with other MPs and say, look, this is very important. Can we debate that? Would you um, support an application for a backbench business debate? And then, I mean, there, there's a lot of demand on that as well. Um, but uh, you might eventually get a debate uh, uh, on, uh, uh, on, on that issue. And then you get a government minister sitting there for an hour and a half or whatever, listening to what people have to say, and they have to respond and make commitments or not commitments. And, uh, and again, uh, you know, in lots of these Westminster Hall debates, the government minister first says no. They say no. Can you do this? Can you do that? Nah. 
we're, we're keeping it as it is. Um, and it is also true, the minister always says no before, before they finally say yes. So you have to continue to be at it. It takes time. But a debate in Parliament is also something that you could be asking for. You could even do it as a member of the public and go through the petitions uh, 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 thing. In Parliament, you can, if you get 10,000 10, signatories, uh, a government response um, is required. If you get 100,000 signatories, quite a lot, but you can maybe through your networks achieve that. Uh, uh, you get uh, uh, you, you get a debate in Parliament through the e-petitions uh, 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 system. You can look it up how that works, but we can also sing, send you a link from my uh, from my office of how to create a petition, uh, and and then it goes into it flies into everybody's inboxes across the country. Please sign the petition. If you get a hundred thousand signatures, it's got to be to be debated in Parliament. There are several ways of getting a debate. Debate is a good way of raising um, the profile of an issue. Thank you. That we're all fired up here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's lots to do if you're campaigning. Um, campaigning is fun, yeah, uh, and it's got to be fun, uh, and it has to sustain you through the through the the, the, the troughs. Um, so always have fun as a group. That's what I would say as a as a veteran campaigner. Yeah, if you get really bogged down, you know, try to create something that is fun. And I think with food, you can also create quite a lot of fun. Uh, within your group or, or having some some actions on the ground that engages people around food and veg and healthy growing. So always also in your campaign, don't only think about the, 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 the tough graft, think about the things that could be fun and inspiring. Mm. Yeah. Um, um, we have uh, an issue that Hannah raised with government petitions is the delay. Uh, do you want to bring that up, Hannah? Sure. Um, so, um, excuse me. So, one of the first things, uh, actually, the, the advice from Vera and her team um, was that we should um, get a government petition uh, to reinstate the school fruit and veg scheme, which obviously um, I was on board with. Um, and it's a really, really simple process. So, I submitted the petition. Um, we, I think we were told initially it was about seven days, the turnaround time, because obviously they're moderated. Um, and we got to about 10 days and it wasn't it wasn't looking good and the petitions team the petitions committee are very responsive they're really good at replying to emails but they can't give you any information so after a couple of weeks of our, my petition being submitted um they still weren't able to give me any sort of time frame and actually i had an email from the petitions committee last week so the third week of September, saying that my petition that I submitted in the first week of June was still in the list. And obviously it's no longer relevant, which is why um, we actually were then given advice to just go ahead with a change.org petition, which mm -hmm. I really didn't want to do initially because of obviously all the problems with um, a sort of unmoderated petition, but we didn't really have any choice. Yeah, I mean, Parliament really works on a very reducted um, uh, basis and a little bit like the, the testing. If you don't have testing capacity, you just would suppress demand. Um, and I think that's what happened there because uh, we, we currently in a very reduced form debate things in Parliament and, and it, it's a very complicated process of people coming in and so on and so forth. So um, the debates that were initiated through the petitions that happened in, in normal times every month or so, have only happened once since COVID. So I think they're just artificially suppressing the demand for it because we simply can't have them in Parliament currently under COVID restrictions. I think that's what's happened. Uh, and, 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 and therefore, fair enough, the, um, uh, uh, the debate route through petitions is, 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 is very um, currently very cumbersome and, and, and frustrating. It's actually the same process as, uh, you know, if, if you go through the Westminster Hall or backbench business debates. Westminster Hall is completely closed. We used to have three or four debates every day in Westminster Hall, which are very much those debates on issues like yours, uh, rather than the big um, bill debates on you know, the internal markets bill. Uh, Westminster Hall debate is probably um, a good place for a debate like that, uh, but we don't have any. 
um, and, 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 and the backbench um, business route is also very much reduced. They're, they're slowly coming back. The backbench business debates is in the main chamber. So we've always got, we've got two debating chamber, the main chamber that you see with the green benches and the investments of all. So yes, there is, I mean, the issue is, I think is a long-term issue anyway. Um, COVID is with us uh, and we have to accept that. Um, so I think in that sense, you just have to have a little bit of patience, either that uh, the, the, parliament, the parliamentary authorities find ways of having more debates in parliament, because uh, you know, it might still be months and even years away before we find a, a vaccine and, and can go back to pre-COVID times if that is ever possible. Um, uh, but, but sort of watch this space really. Um, and again, uh, if I find that there's a bit of an easing of, of the whole system that currently holds up that we have um, uh, Westminster Hall or backbench business debates. And I'll let you know, because I think it is a good way of raising um, the issue. And your issue is not going to be something that is going away in six months time. It's a long-term thing. So you have to take a long-term view on this. Thank you very much for that. So any, any support you can give us? Um, yeah, I will. Raising that. I a debate would be brilliant. But yeah, it's, it's currently possibly, uh, again, one of those things which is very frustrating. Um, uh, but that's COVID related and I, I can't really give you another answer to that. Yeah. All right. Um, if there are any more questions uh, for Vera or Hannah or, or Vera about the campaign, um, type them now because we're about to, to wrap up. Um, but thank you again, uh, Vera and Hannah, for giving us your insight. Uh, I hope um, everyone is feeling the way I'm feeling, fired up, <laughs> campaigning. Um, I think it, oh, hopefully everyone took, took away some, some tips um, and some new knowledge as well. And look out uh, for the email from me or Vera about the, the local action we're planning. We would really love to get uh, your local signatures to this open letter and help promoting the e-action as well. Um, from Natalie, uh, persistence with a dash of fun. That's it. Great summary. <laughs> Um, and um, from us, uh, I guess we'll see you all very soon. We do these campaigners breakfasts regularly um, on, a, on a monthly basis. So I hope to see you on the next one. I don't know if you want to, to say any last words, Vera, Hannah, the other Vera. Um, yeah, I'll just say thank you so much for, yeah, for having me. And um, I, still, I still can't really th um, believe that we, yeah, that together we um, managed to do it. But um, yeah, I feel, I feel really proud of the way that, yeah, we all, all work together. And thank you to, um, for Vera to, for her help. And um, I, yeah, I feel fired up for, for the bigger campaign now. Bye, bye, bye. Um, thank you for having me. Um, keep going. Uh, I, I'm, I'm with you. Um, and you can always ask me back for another session if necessary. Thank you very much again. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye. See you next time. Bye. Bye.